Hi, this is Bruce Rawls. I'm speaking again with Dr. Bob Rosenthal, who is co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace and the author of several books, the most recent of which is From Loving One to One Love, Transforming Relationships Through A Course in Miracles. And I'm uh, uh, making my way through it uh, with glee <laughs> and, and great gusto and, and savoring, savoring all the writing because it's, it's very good. Um, and so what I thought we could talk about today, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Bob uh, thank, graciously uh, uh, agreed to uh, converse with you about it, is uh, the next five chapters, uh, uh, six through 10 in his new book. And uh, so anyway, welcome Dr. Bob. And, and I, I really enjoyed uh, reading these next few chapters and look forward to uh, getting your insights uh, about them. Thank you so much, Bruce. I really appreciate that. I mean, one of the things that, unless you've written a book, you don't realize, but in writing it, you're so immersed. And it's kind of like at each stage of the process, you gain a little more distance and a little more distance. But at least for me, I never have a sense whether what I've written is really all that good or worthwhile until I stand back. So I can look at my first book, Plagues to Miracles, or the, the more recent one from Nevermind, Evermind. And at this point, I can go, yeah, I achieved what I wanted to achieve. I'm pleased with them. I'm happy with them. But the new one, not there yet. So hearing this from you is, <laughs> is wonderful. I guess it's sort of um, like a, uh, uh, you know, a corollary to that idea that you only find your own salvation by seeing it in your brother. So I'm, I'm hearing it from you and realizing, okay, maybe the book... Uh, was worthwhile. I'm going to just hold up uh, a, a copy so people can see what it looks like, if that's okay. Please do, because I don't have my copy here. It's in Oregon. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. There we go. Or will, or will be soon, I should say. Yeah. yeah, I'm not doing a very good job here. But anyway, that's the book cover. Um, hello. Uh, and, um, and it is available, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, e uh, Kindle, etc. cetera. Um, what do they usually say? Wherever fine books are sold. So, I, there's even a link on acimblog.com if people want to use that. So. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Full, full yeah. disclosure, I, I do get Amazon affiliate income from those links, but uh, good. why not? Good. Why not? Yeah. Someone should. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Amazon. In, anyway, you, your books are wonderful. This one's no exception, and I, I think I'm enjoying it at least as much, if not more, than all the others, e even though all those were, were very well done and, and very yeah. insightful as well. So, Thanks so much. So, um, and this one, of course, is all about relationships. And uh, so I, I was making some some notes and copying and and uh, you know some of the, the the gems that really stood out for me as I was reading today, um, and the, in the in the first uh, chapter that I read, which was uh, uh, I guess it was part of six or or maybe into seven, um, you know about getting to the cause, and you use the metaphor of an African village, uh, you know, discovering you know that the, they had a con con contamination problem with their drinking water, and it's like well if you're using it is simultaneously as a cesspool and a water supply. It's like, you, there may be some issues there. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we, we forget to look at the cause and, uh, and so much, so often we try to bandaid the, the effect. And, um, you know, you point out, uh, um, if I can just read some of this, uh, you know, momentary relief is fine, but getting to the root is the long-term systemic solution. Ego's motto is seek and do not find. The ego doesn't want to solve problems because it is itself the cause of the problem. Believing in the non-existent ego is the problem. And, um, and then, then uh, this is um, uh, an admonition that, you know, an, an encouragement to generalize. Uh, problems are really all the same and must be recognized as one if the one solution that solves them all is to be accepted. So anyway, I, I think that's uh, really, really helpful to because it's so easy to get uh, with what the course calls level confusion caught up in thinking that, well, I have to fix the dream. I have to, you know, work on the effect and somehow the, the cause will magically take care of itself. Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, you zeroed right in on what I think is one of the most important teachings there is. And I think it gets muddled and misunderstood by a lot of people from two different directions. So first there's the direction of turning the Holy Spirit into some version of the tooth fairy or a genie in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And if I pray to him or ask him, he will fix all of my problems in the world magically, which of course persists in the idea that those problems are real mm -hmm. and come from outside and have an impact on you. But in, in my opinion, equally difficult and problematic 
is the opposite version. And I, I hear this and have gotten emails about this where, well, it's all one, it's all fine. So why are we even talking about this? Why are we doing anything about it? And I think that is um, a particularly unworthy form of denial mm -hmm. in that, of course, it's all one. Of course, that's where we are. And guess what? Even the dreaming mind that has weaved this illusion around us in which we um, have such strong belief, even that mind is ultimately just part of the one. You know, distinguishing between dream and reality is really a false dichotomy. And if you say, well, nothing from the world of oneness can possibly impact the world of duality because only oneness is real, you're actually setting up a, a false duality because you're making the world of illusion its own entity and saying, no, no, nothing can affect it. You know, um, quick, quick aside, yeah. one of my absolute favorite passages in the course comes at the end of lesson 186, where it's talking about um, how, you know, I'm going to find it and read it. So, okay. you know, since we're, this is, this is informal. I mean, we don't have TV cameras buzzing all around us, <laughs> um, but I, I just think it, it, to me, it addresses that question of, well, how can the Holy Spirit solve my problems here? And, and there's, you know, the anthropomorphization of, oh, Holy Spirit is like this being that, as I say, comes in and waves a magic wand. So this is from the last two paragraphs of Lesson 186. And it's just saying, you know, at the end of paragraph 13 and into 14, for love must give, and what is given in his name takes on the form most useful in a world of form. <clears throat> Let's just pause there for a second. Love must give. Love expands. Love extends. That's just part of the nature of love. So what is given in his name takes on the form most useful in a world of form. We don't know that form, but the Holy Spirit does. And it's not like he recognizes the form and goes, you know, like uh, the angel Clarence in, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> wow, you know, Jimmy Stewart's having a really tough time. Let's do this. No, it, it's almost like, and I wrote about this in From Plagues to Miracles, it's like water seeking its lowest point. It will just flow there. It doesn't need to have an intelligence as we define it. It doesn't need to find the path. It's just going to do that. So when we open up to that reality of love, it will affect the form um, that we most need within the illusion that is absolutely not real, but for the mind that believes it, the split mind of the sonship does seem to be real. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go on just in the second paragraph. For love must give, and what is given in his name takes on the form most useful in a world of form. These are the forms which never can deceive because they come from formlessness itself. Forgiveness is an earthly form of love which, as it is in heaven, has no form. Yet, what is needed here is given here as it is needed. And I'll stop there. And over and over, the Course repeats this. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, an interesting variation on the idea of, you know, if you accept Jesus, you're saved. That puts it in terms of a credo and a belief system. This is more like if you follow in the way that Jesus uh, led, you know, if we walk along the path that he already macheted all the weeds out of the way for us, mm -hmm. things do get taken care of. Yeah. It, it's our fear thoughts and our past that come up and go, well, yeah, that didn't work out terribly well before, and I'm really afraid it's going to go off the rails again. Um, but if we give it over to love, then it, it doesn't. Um, and you know what? If we set up the Holy, Fair, the Holy Spirit as a holy tooth fairy, okay, you know, eventually you'll get over that. Children do get over the idea of the tooth fairy. Um, you know, that, that's not what it's saying. But so that passage, you know, we've got to solve problems at the level of their cause, not their effect. Um, you know, which lessons 79 and 80 also just nail perfectly. Um, the, the section you were re referring to, um, my medical training comes up and in rereading the book, I think, God, you know, he almost sounds like a real doctor. Uh, I was a psychiatrist, but, but I remember a lot of it. Um, and this was a particular story that a medical resident um, who I, I was 
supervising them at uh, San Francisco General in the 90s, trying to help you know, medical residents in training understand the impact of the mind. But this was just a story that was presented at a conference of a guy who was in Africa and this tribe was, or these people were getting very, very sick with abdominal stuff. And the point I made was they could have given them antibiotics and they would have gotten better, but then they would have gotten sick again because the real problem was there was a small lake near where they lived and they were taking their drinking water out of one side and defecating in the other side, mm -hmm. not realizing that it was all one. Um, and therefore to cure this mysterious illness, it wasn't about antibiotics, it wasn't treating the end effect, it was public health, teaching them to dig latrines and not pollute their drinking water. We could extend that metaphor and say, yeah, we're always polluting the pure stream that comes to us from God with our ego thoughts, and if we can clean that up and you know get rid of the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence, then the purity comes through and, um, and we're in a lot better shape, we're a lot happier. So yeah, that, that's good, good focus there. I, uh, that goes right to the heart of it. Yeah, and the, the one lake is really just the one mind that we all share because ideas leave not their source as we're reminded in the course, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, let's see, um, there's, uh, here's another quote. Uh, the ego takes an, an altogether different and characteristically insane approach to problem solving. It ignores the cause and deals only with the effects to solve any problem then whatever its form requires us to see the ego's misdirection for what it is, then reject it and choose a different path, that of the Holy Spirit. And you've, and you've touched on that of how we want to make uh, Holy Spirit into a tooth fairy, you know, and then also, uh, you know, we, you know as, as egos, we, <laughs> we try to mess with it in a number of different ways to, to and both of them to, to, you know, all of them to keep the ego's thought system intact, huh? Yeah, well, you know, it's that fundamental distinction the Course makes between bringing illusion to truth, which is what we need to do, um, and which our last talk on the book was all about, exposing that darkness within us to the light. So the confusion between bringing illusion to truth as opposed to bringing truth to illusion. So when we make those problems out there real in the myriad forms that they seem to show up, and then go, Holy Spirit, help us with this problem, um, rather than, you know, well, to quote the Course again, help me in the decision that brought the fear about, which is where all the problems originated in the separation, and this particular problem just being one manifestation of that. When we do that, um, you know, one way, the illusion gets thinner and more transparent. Mm -hmm. The other way, we're attempting to get God, in a sense, to fix our illusions without realizing that that's a very subtle little um, subterfuge by the ego to make us continue to believe that they're real. Um, you know, and isn't it interesting that the mark of a you know wise, mature human being is good judgment and that you've learned how to handle situations in life um, you know, this is sort of the pinnacle of the ego's teaching. You, you've used your past, you read widely, you understand people. And what A Course in Miracles basically says is, yeah, and good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> because that will yeah. never solve the problem of death. Right, right. As long as we believe that we are these bodies and these separate individual identities, and I think this is really, you know, the power of the Buddha's insight, too, um, when he, you know, encountered, uh, you know, sickness, aging, and death wandering outside his palace grounds. Um, the power is, wow, I'm going to die, and everyone I know and love is going to die. And I don't know, maybe they'll go first, maybe I'll go first. But either way, if we conceptualize ourselves in this way, um, you know, terrible bitter loss is, is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the course is, you know, as per the words out of Bill Thetford's mouth, there must be a better way. And that's what A Course in Miracles is, is leading us to. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that, that better way is, is inevitably through forgiveness, as, as that to quote from one of my favorites too, actually, you know, that forgiveness is an earthly form of love. Um, and, and that you know that that's really our mechanism by which we're instructed through the course to to 
let go of that thought system of sin, guilt, fear, death, and and desolation of every sort, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, if you believe that love can't enter the world of illusion, you are making it real and more powerful than love. Of course it can enter. Um, the Course tells us in a number of passages, it's the only reality. You know, I've saved up all your loving thoughts. Only your loving thoughts are real. Not because the thought itself is real, you know, oh, I, I, I'm feeling a loving, magnanimous impulse towards someone, but the love is the only reality. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, another another uh, phrase that you use that I, I really relate to, and I, I have a actually I have a mnemonic for the three steps of forgiveness of reveal, release, and replace. And and you use the phrase reveal and release in in your writing too. It's like that that wow. clicked immediately for me. But I, I was actually sh sharing a bit of that uh, over the weekend uh, in an online class uh, uh, through the Rocky Mountain Miracle System, uh, uh, Center in in Denver and. Uh, you know, workbook lesson 23 has that in, in one, one sentence. Let's see if I can find it real quick. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's just it's the, the reveal, release, replace. It, and I, I, again, I, the, I, those two words, that, and that's, those are the two parts that we need to help Holy Spirit with and, and actively assist. Um, here it is. This is uh, yeah, lesson 23, paragraph 5. Uh, the idea for today introduces the thought that you are not trapped in the world you see because its cause can be changed. This change requires first that the cause be identified and then let go so that it can be replaced. So the identification is, is where we reveal to ourselves that our projections aren't the problem. It's not about the other person. And since, you know, your book talks so much about relationships and, and how crucial that is to the course's curriculum, um, oftentimes that identification is saying, no, it's not this person. It's not that person. It's not these group of people that are the problem. It's, it, and we, we reel it back in. We reveal to ourselves that it's, it's not out there. It's in my, it's my, <laughs> my stuff, my complicit involvement in the mind. And then we release it with the Holy Spirit's help by seeing that it's not working. And then, you know, say, as Ken Wapnick said, a maladaptive solution to a non-existent problem. You know, it's, it's, if it's dysfunctional, why would we want to keep doing that? And then the last step, of course, is the replacement, which is automatic, and we don't have to do anything. In fact, if we try to do things, uh, we're, we're messing with <laughs> the perfection that's already there. And, so uh, out the yeah. I'm getting that internet connection is unstable thing again. Oh, okay. Anyway, it, it faded out. So, yeah, there we go. Okay. Anyway, so what uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the reveal and replace because uh, you know you've. Um, I, I have my own variation on that, uh -huh. um, which uh, I, I recently set out in um, in, in, in in a uh, a video I did for um, Bill Free's presenter series, and I I don't want to step on that, so maybe I'll come back to that later. I'm supposed oh, okay. to, you know, make that for that particular audience. But here's what I would say, and I think it goes to, you can't forgive if you don't, if you aren't aware of the unforgiveness and the grievance in yourself. Right. So right. in this sense, um, forgiveness always involves um, an ongoing process of not just scanning, but noticing where we pop out of forgiveness into unforgiveness, where the grievance has come up. And I'll tell you, um, you know, the more you put this into practice, and I'm sure you, you know, can um, echo me on this one, Bruce, the more you discover just how uh, insistent and nefarious the ego mind is. Mm -hmm. I mean, those little judgments, you know, they come up everywhere, you know, about your pets, about people on the road, about, about things that aren't human, the weather, um, you know, I, the, I used to say the ego is a nightmare factory because it's always <laughs> manufacturing these terrible what if scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's also a judgment factory. You know, oh, yeah. it, do, it literally doesn't know how to interface with experience without establishing a judgment in between. It can never just be purely in the present. There's always interposing the past, which brings with it the judgment. So when we go to the recognition, or what I you know, like to call awareness, um, as we do that, those steps become kind of inevitable. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, 
Because if you're aware that you are holding an unforgiveness and aware, and then aware that it's leading you to suffer, then why would you hold on to it? Exactly. Exactly. I guess what, one other thought here, it can take time to realize that what we're holding on to is causing us to suffer. We've been trained to believe that, you know, by holding grievances and making judgments, we can armor ourselves against the world and its, you know, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to quote Hamlet. Um, no, you know, once you're aware of it, you can kind of come back to it again and again, like, like that toothache, and finally you realize, no, nah, that tooth can't be saved, it's got to go. Um, something that I had to do last week, so it's front and center in my mind. Um, so, so, you know, once you establish the awareness, all the other steps kind of flow from it. Yeah. Somewhere, though, there does have to be a decision. Um, so instead of replace, to me, decision is, is like where that power really comes in. I am deciding that I don't want this, and, that, and I know there is something else that I can replace it with, so that's where replacing would come in. There is a better way, and I make the decision for that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it all comes back to that decision-making point of the mind, which only only has two choices, ego and That's Holy right. Spirit, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only power remaining to you, you know? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I appreciate you you uh, citing that in the writing that I uh, read today that you know that's our one remaining freedom right <laughs> that's, that's it the one remaining freedom thank you <laughs> yeah yeah and it, it's interesting too because you know we we think that in the world we have all these choices and, and the ego's strategy is so much you know obfuscation and 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 i, I think I, you know, a lot of what you wrote um wrote that i read today uh you know going further into your this book is about you know the dissociation and the and the fragmentation and the, the hiding and and trying to obscure and and obfuscate um, the stuff that's in our minds and as you were just talking about you know if, you, if we really when we really start to look at it it can be a little you know dot you know not more, more than just a little really daunting actually because <laughs> it's like holy crap there's, there's that all that stuff's going through my mind when, when we really honestly look at, at all of the judgments and combinations in a given day it's like you know multitudes it's, it's insane I yeah mean, yeah 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 it really is really is and some of them seem to be subtle but the course says you know there's no order of difficulty so right. the, the least little annoyance or the least little oh i wish this the fan that's sitting next to me was somewhere else or or i wish you know this other thing on the desk is could could be different you know is it, but all, all those things are just myriad and and when we start noticing those it seems like it can be just really scary and and i think that it can be a discouraging uh, observation but um there's there's other elsewhere in the course that I think it suggests that you know that's really been going on all the time, but yeah. we just we're just raising it to awareness, kind of like you know uh, our grandparents probably didn't have much awareness of all the craziness of what's going on in the world, but now that we have 24/7 nonstop media, you know we if we want to we can we can get news from all over the world and find you know countless uh, accounts of atrocities and calamities and natural disasters and and you know viral outbreaks and and skirmishes and and you know hostilities of every imaginable sort um so but it's not that th those have, have never been you know haven't always been happening it's just that now we're more aware of them and i think the same thing has is kind of true with the course is that when we really start looking at our mind and remove the blinders we just become more aware that that stuff has been the ego's ticker tape <laughs> all <laughs> along. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, people do generally feel like the world is getting worse and worse and worse. And, um, you know, I don't think I've been here long enough to really weigh in on that. Yeah. But yeah. I do sometimes reflect on what would it have been like to be I don't know, a woman in the 15th or 16th century, I imagine you couldn't go out on by yourself. Yeah. You know, yeah. that if you walked a little further than where your family or the people who know you and could protect you would be, um, you were in trouble. Um, if you Probably were still true in certain parts of the world. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, saying for a guy, you know, if you don't go out without your, your tribe, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a solo person, you're probably going to be, you know, attacked and killed. And, and so I, I think it was probably much more difficult. The other side of it is, look at all the, the wisdom that's available to us now. 
Right. You know, I remember um, when the first sort of spirit. Exhibit A. That in particular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. But I remember walking into, you know, um, some of the earlier uh, spiritual New Age bookstores, you know, like a Samuel Weiser in New York or Bodhi Tree in L.A., and just, you know, looking around at this wealth of, 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 of knowledge and truth and different pathways and thinking, yeah, there's never been a time in human history where this was so available. You know, you'd have to sign on to some, some esoteric tradition and spend 15 years hauling, you know, latrines before they start sharing the, the real good stuff with you. And, and then that's, that's the narrow path you follow. And, and if you follow it far enough, maybe it opens into truth. But we have so much. And thank you for holding up A Course in Miracles, because as someone who has explored a lot of different paths, coming back to this, I, I really, I do feel it's about as straight a shot towards capital T truth as, as has ever been. That's the appeal. That's why people will tell I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I just, yeah. I, I had to have this book. It's also why it's so difficult and why I had to have this book and then I put it on a shelf for 12 years. And now I've just come back to it and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's a tough, it's so radical that as you begin to take it in, you really do recognize that everything you believed before is pretty insane, but it's what you believed. It's what we all believed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to use the metaphor that if we all grew up in North Korea, you know, we believe that the, the leader is the leader, capital L, and you know, he was, whatever all those claims were, um, and that having regular food shortages is just what you go through and, you know, all of that. Um, yeah, yeah. We yeah, only it, know what we know from our own past and we make that the norm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and sometimes the norm can be, seem, seem pretty bizarre when we look at it more objectively, but, but as you're pointing out, you know, what the objectivity, what we think is ob objectivity is probably so, so distorted relative to truth that <laughs> we're basically, you know, as a first approximation, total, all totally clueless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, and, and so what the course and the Holy spirit do, of course, is they work with us at whatever level um, we're at, you know, whatever, Whatever you bring into, whatever is brought into awareness that you are recognize as unforgiving or untruth or the ego, well, that's where the work begins. And it's not even, it's not worthwhile trying to figure out, well, you know, what happens when I get to that final step and, you know, God's going to come and I'm going to disappear in a blaze of light. But because unless you're actually there, your ego is going to interpret that for you as God's going to kill you you know, um, and, and therefore you're not going to follow it. But it's all we have to do is look at those, those layers that have been exposed, those episodes and um, feelings and memories of unforgiveness, of grievance, that are most obvious to work on. And when we work through them, we will experience release. And then some more will come to the surface. Um, and then some more. And that's okay because the Holy Spirit can't ever work through fear. You know, love can't bring about fear. If, if there's a part of your mind that's lashing you saying, come on, get with it, do these exercises, get down to the, the core fear that is the ego, you're listening to the ego. Yeah, yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a phrase that I find helpful and that's gentle vigilance. Mm -hmm. And and there's no there's no whip cracking in, in the Holy Spirit's curriculum. And it doesn't demand or, or you know, really make any any requests other than um, just it's merely like like a lighthouse or like you know a beacon yeah. that just is is constantly shining. It's like whenever you're ready, I'm there. Exactly. <laughs> and interestingly enough, my mom has this metaphysical group that's been meeting here in, in her house in, Cal in Northern California for many years. And there was a lady who came by the other day who was, was channeling all these archangels and nature spirits and the whole thing. And, and, and I, and I, you know, in, enjoyed hearing what she said in, in particular when she said, yeah, and our guidance is really trying to get our attention all the time or, you know, or basically just waiting for us. And I thought, you know, she may be coming from a different jargon, but, but in terms of you know, the message that she was sharing is that, you know, we have all the help we could possibly use, 
but we we both you know usually go la 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 you know and and block right. it out you know and that's and that's why you know the course is admonition that the you know it's it's up to us to remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence but we have all the help we could possibly want to do that huh yeah we just have to accept it yeah and it's yeah. up to us you know you can elect what you want to take at a given time it's right. up to us the reason that there can never be urgency or judgment or shame about how fast the pace of your learning is, is because fast learning is a concept that's only relevant within a world of time. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit doesn't abide there. Holy Spirit abides in eternity where all of this has, it wrapped up the instant that we deludedly believed it could even have happened. So how could the Holy Spirit have any urgency? <laughs> you know, um, the Holy Spirit's already, it, the Holy Spirit is an aspect of the Christ mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the memory of who you really are, what you really are, what all of us really are, that can't be repressed. And that's always hanging around, like you said, like a lighthouse. But if sailors in a storm go, oh my God, there's light over there. Beware, let's not go there, um, you know, or, or pay no attention to it. They'll hit the rocks a number of times. So there's never urgency, but there is uh, a need for, as you say, gentle vigilance and consistency to the extent that you have the readiness. Yeah. And there are plenty of people, myself included, who are, you know, who have gone for a few years as lapsed course students. Um, I used to tell people, <laughs> yeah, I used to say, well, the course is the cornerstone, the foundation of everything I'm doing. But I'm not really doing the, the workbook lessons now. I'm not really reading the text. And then I would come back into it and, you know, be like, oh, this is great. And then I'd go explore some other path for a while. It's what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. it may not be what anyone else needs to do. But, but it's not about insistence. Uh, because, as I said, only the ego would do that. Yeah. That, that that's, ties into another th thought that when I first picked up the course uh, back in the mid-80s and really started, you know, seriously, you know, looking into it, uh, one of the ideas that really was wonderful was the, the inevitability of the peace that, you know, sooner or later, it's, again, like you, like you say, it's, it's um, our true, our true uh, being is outside of the, the dream of space time. And so it's already a done deal. We're just, you know, having this prodigal dream um, you know, that, you know, is usually interpreted as a nightmare, but we're already home dreaming of exile. Right. And so, the inevitability of that comfort and that peace and that, that innocence that we thought we lost is, is waiting for us. Um, it just, it just awaits our decision. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we've even already made the decision. It's yeah. In, yeah. In yeah. eternity. Um, you know, we keep playing out that one little moment, the time of terror over and over and over and over mm -hmm. because we keep thinking there's something here that we want, you know, well, you know, didn't work out with this person, this job, this event, uh, but yeah, there might be another. And as long as as long as that temptation is there, uh, yeah, we'll we'll stay anchored um, in the illusion to some extent. But truly, at a certain point, um, and I am speaking from experience here, you look at those old temptations, and you kind of go man, you know, what, what, what's there? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're nice things. You know, I, I love hanging out with friends. I mean, you know, a good restaurant is still very fun, but you know, do you really, is this your salvation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is, is earning a million bucks a year your salvation? I mean, as a psychotherapist, I worked with many, uh, you know, very, very wealthy people. They all had their problems, you know? Um, and you know their bodies had pain, and their kids had their issues, and 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 even if it's perfect, at some point, as the Buddha noted, you're going to get sick, you're going to get old, and you're going to die. Or the people you love will do that first. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know which is worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, and that and that's it, it reminds me of another quote in the course i'm going to paraphrase of course as usual but uh, you know that's one of the, the craziest ideas that you know that those that you love can can perish and disappear you know it's like how, how could that be if if love is really eternal but you know we've we've you know, put in us this proxy re substitute replacement god that has, blows hot and cold one you know different days and and uh, 
some, some days is, is favorable and other days not. And, and uh, um, anyway, it, it's just kind of that whole crazy thought system of thinking that uh, you know, the creator has anything to do with yeah. the, the world of dreams. And uh, it's yeah. just, how, how could a loving creator create death? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, life is love. It's endless. It's eternal. The very idea of death is completely non nonsensical within that paradigm. Um, and yet here we are, you know, I mean, in this section of section of uh, chapter 19 of the text called the obstacles to peace, um, you know, the, the third obstacle is the attraction of death, mm -hmm. the attraction to death. And I remember thinking, well, that makes no sense. Who's attracted <laughs> to death? Why would anyone be attracted to death? Well, at the deepest level, the ego is attracted to death because it thinks that it proves that God is vulnerable, fallible, mortal, and can be overcome by the ego. But even at a more sort of practical, you know, um, as we live it moment, how often do we think about death? You know, I think about my own father, um, who I loved a lot. He was, he was a physician and he was constantly looking at his lab values. And, you know, and if he got good labs, he was very uplifted. Oh, I might not die for a while. And, you know, <laughs> and if one of those lab numbers was not in the range that he wanted it, uh-oh, you know, I, I'm in real trouble. The fixity with which death shows up in our minds in one form or another, because remember, the Course tells us that loss is a form of death, sadness is a form of death, um, uh, pain is a form of death. You know, that which is not love is a form of death. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that we do focus on and fixate on so many of these shows that at some level, there is an attraction to the idea of death. Again, it's, it's very subtle. Nobody would acknowledge that at the surface level, but it is there. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. some people like to say, well, you know, every death is a suicide because at some point the individual mind decides it's done. Um, but, you know, uh, every death is also a non-event because it can't happen. Yeah, yeah. It, great insights. And, and, and one that I, th I also find helpful is, is when I hear the word death, uh, you know, more and more, I try to remember to, to think of it as like the flip side of the, the ego's dream of birth, too. And, mm -hmm. and if I think birth and death are just, you know, uh, aspects of the same misunderstanding, about our real identity, which is completely shared oneness eternally. And, and if, if we buy into ego's dream of separation and you know, take this, this infinite spirit and try to cram it down into this little body, and whether, whether it's a birth or a death thing, it's uh, either way, it's, we're, we're making up something that, that uh, doesn't play out in truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it. I mean, what is it that gets born? What is it that dies? The physical body. Yeah. Are you that body? If you think you are, then, you know, uh, paraphrasing uh, against the course, then birth is a beginning and death is an ending. Mm -hmm. um, if you are an idea in the mind of God, um, so you didn't create yourself, you are an idea in the mind of God. And that when you recognize that and experience it, um, what dies, you know, I mean, yeah. how, you know, the, the death of the body is no longer your death. And that's why the course can promise eternity. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the spiritual systems that preach resurrection as the eternal life of the body in some way, shape or form were clearly written and propagated by people in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> when you get old enough, it's like, why would I want to keep you this? Realize things, yeah. And what would the purpose for that be? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great that's great i i was i was skimming some of the th the wonderful uh writing that you that i read today and uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna grab another one of these that ties into what you were just talking about um and that is oh, uh let's see um being open does not give you license to be obnoxious <laughs> um uh, holy spirit always guides us through kindness and seeks not to change the world including my own projection on others and then uh and then I, this is my note about what you just had written is pathological liars as black holes but egos are made up so no light can escape um and then um uh, and then you, you, a quote from what you wrote is what is still more dangerous is that you start to believe your own lies 
and then you no long, longer know yourself uh, for what you would hide is hidden from you. And I think, I think that's, again, the ego strategy is always to keep hidden the, this idea that, that if we really look at the absurdity of, of you know, can, you know, equating our identity and our being with a body and a persona and, and seeing how ludicrous that is, you know, like you say, why, why would any sane person, and usually it takes a few decades before it really sinks in, yeah. want to equate themselves with something that's, you know, essentially perishable and, and, and is, has no way out of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to, bring forth into awareness, um, you know, what we'd rather hide. So one of the chapters that I uh, uh, played with in the book is based on the line from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas that essentially says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. Now, it won't actually destroy you, but it will keep you from waking up for as long as you don't bring it forth. Exactly. Because, again, this is, this is tricky stuff. If you resist bringing it forth and feel like there is something negative there, then you're making that real for you. You're also making it part of your self-image. Um, I can think of things that I was embarrassed about in high school, uh, you know, like... Uh, sexual things that didn't work out perhaps and you know in the fullness of time it's like that bent me out of shape mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but at the if we invest it with meaning if we invest it with importance uh, it becomes part of our notion of self and, and and forgiveness is the opposite process forgiveness is bringing it to the surface releasing it and when we think we see those same traits in other people recognizing that we're, what we're really seeing are our own projections mm -hmm. and that we're being given an opportunity to forgive those, those things in ourselves which are being brought up to us um, by our seeing them in, in, in someone else. Yeah. Um, one of the later chapters in the book goes into the, that whole idea of projection as a mirror. Um, yeah, and, and that's such an important idea too. Cause, and, and, and ultimately, I think that leads to the the idea that uh, and you know revelation that that everyone really is our savior seen properly yes okay. you know, everyone's e either bringing you know us a gift of love or or calling for it and in either case it's my call for love you know or my expression of love yeah and what what appears to be the case yeah yeah either it's an expression of love or a call for help and healing and either way you respond with love but but that it i mean so, you know, it's a book on relationship, and the title plays on that, From Loving One to One Love. We were taught that love is about a one-to-one -one transaction. I fall in love with someone. Um, if I'm lucky, they fall in love with me back, and we walk happily into the sunset. Rather, what we want is to recognize there's only one love, and it plays out in different forms in relationships, but that all relationships, every single one, whether it's the casual person you walk by on the street or your life partner um, of 50 years, either way, these, this is where the lessons come in. As you said, each person offers the opportunity for salvation, yeah. um, which we can choose to accept or not. And, you know, and if you're not ready, I mean, you know, if someone uh, tortured you as a child uh, or, or was maliciously cruel and horrible and ruined your, your high school years, as long as we're talking about high school, it may be tough to forgive them. Um, I think somewhere in the book I write about, well, you know, so what if you encounter such a person at your, you know, 30th high school reunion? Well, if they're still a jerk, it probably doesn't matter so much because you're going to walk away and never see them again. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you might discover that they changed remarkably because you've changed remarkably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you might discover some information that allows you to reframe their behavior. And I, I do spend a fair amount of time talking about reframes and understand it differently. Oh, that person who was such a bully, you know, he was getting beat up by his drunken father every time he went home. Now I understand it. You know, yeah, it wasn't yeah. something about me personal. So 
forgiveness can play out in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to discover the ways that work best for us and then indeed apply them. Yeah. And, and that compassion is always warranted. Uh, just using that example of the, you know, pr parental <laughs> bullying and, and, you know, how, you know, and if we're not aware of what we're mirroring and, and repattern, you know, pick up the patterns and just, you know, replicate yeah. them. I mean, that's, that can be a real easy thing to do, except we're not at peace. And, but if we can, catch ourselves and say oh like you say if whether it's you know in yourself or someone else and say oh well, that, that makes you know we're all in the same boat it brings us to that awareness that, that yeah. we really can afford to be compassionate with everyone including ourselves well and all being in the same boat is it's a good um it's a good way to look at it you know I, it's it's i've found it remarkable and so uplifting that when a natural disaster strikes it generally bring, brings out the best in people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, maybe if the whole world collapsed, we'd be in Mad Max, you know, dystopian uh, fantasies. But maybe that's just the ego, you know, strutting its stuff again, because uh -huh. when that tornado hits, when there's a flood, people are helping other people. There, there's a sense that we are all in this together and let's try to, you know, survive it and get out of it together. I, I find that extremely uplifting and extremely hopeful. Yeah, yeah. And I think it is one of those instances where we're playing contrary to ego, that, that sense of union that comes forward does offer us um, an experience of, of forgiveness that may not come in other ways. Yeah, exactly. In those situations, people see each other in a different light. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we all have that, that really, that longing to, to not only belong, but to, to feel like we're part of the solution and 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 the solution really is undoing the walls in our mind ultimately yeah. and and that sense of differences yeah so you know if your self concept is de is um, defined by how you're different than other people and what makes you special whether it's good special or bad special and I'll put those in air quotes then going through something whether it's a natural disaster or being on an NCAA championship basketball team, win or lose, or you know, any of these group endeavors can give us an experience of those individual boundaries dissolving and, and, and having that broader sense of self. Yeah. Yeah, and that broader sense of self is, is uh, what we all want, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's... I it's true. Yeah. I, 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 you mentioned a moment ago that the, uh, the gospel of Thomas, and I, f I found it pretty interesting in reading uh, Gary Renard's books a few years ago that he has the uh, Purse's gospel of Thomas. Uh, my, my favorite quote from that is, is a, is a two word quote, which is be passers by. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, be, yeah. And you mentioned, uh, let's see if I can find this. It says the scholar Elaine Pag Pagels writes, is it Pagels or Pagels? Pagels. Uh, Pagels, okay. The living Jesus of these texts speaks of illusions. Um, let me get rid of this little thing here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, anyway, not of sin and repentance like the Jesus of the New Testament. Instead of coming to save us from sin, he comes as a guide who opens access to spiritual understanding. But when the disciple attains enlightenment, Jesus no longer serves as his spiritual master. The two have become equal, even identical. And I, I thought, you know, that that's such a, you know, again, you know, we're all in the same boat. It's such a, a, you know, a wonderful reminder that the the uh, the course's emphasis on relationship is is really uh, always leading inexorably to uh, the understanding uh, ultimately that we're all the same being, and and then we get there through sameness in order to to yes. give us the training wheels to oneness. I think, yeah. Well, the, you know, in chapter twenty of the text, the course says. There is no order in relationships, either mm -hmm. they are or they are not. Mm -hmm. And in one of those sections, it also says, you know, the arc of heaven is entered two by two. Now, you could repurpose that as an argument for special love. Right. I'm going to right. find my one partner, and that's my <laughs> door to heaven. That's not what it's saying. It's, mm -hmm. It really is, you know, the arc of heaven is entered through relationship. Mm -hmm. You can't get there on your own. You know, to quote a different section, the lonely journey fails because it has excluded what it would find. You can't find union searching for it alone. You've already precluded that outcome. Mm -hmm. So we enter the ark of heaven 
by embracing each relationship. You know, you and I here doing this together uh, virtually through the internet as our, our path back to heaven, which is nothing less, of course, than that state of one-mindedness that lives eternally um, in all of us, that is us. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's, there's, so, there's so many good, so many, exactly. So here, here's another, another one, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, there is no safety in hiding because what's hidden will always strive to emerge. And I was thinking, you know, about the, the, the secret walls, shields, defenses, bears, you know, anything that main, maintains the belief in separation. You know, the, the ego's uh, uh, weapons against openness and, uh, you know. Well, and, and, and then you talk about the, you know, the biological thing of, of uh, um, the, uh, uh, an abscess. I think that was, that was the term. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And how that, you know, when we wall off a problem and, you know, in that section that you have of, you know, bringing things to the light. Um, yes. And, and uh, I, I thought that was a really good analogy because, you know, as, as long as there's a, a, a parent wall around something, there's no way for the help to get in or, or get yeah. out. And it's really, <laughs> which is suppose the same thing yeah exactly um you know the wall why would we need a wall unless we're afraid you know um without fear there's absolutely no need for walls so the very presence of a wall reinforces and preserves the idea that there's something fearful on the other side of it it's actually one of my more favorite little metaphors to play with and one of these days I'm going to be, uh, after I finish my indentured servitude, no, I'm just kidding, writing this five book series, um, I want to write something much lighter and more playful um, that just looks at metaphors and, uh, you know, and, and the idea of a wall is just a very rich one. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the preview. It not only preserves fear, once you build that wall, you can't see what's on the other side of it. So now you have cut off any source of information that would contravene what you believe. And this is what we see playing out in this country today with, you know, um, sort of the bubble, the news bubbles that we get our, mm -hmm. our information from our friends and from selective channels. We've literally, we, we've built a, a virtual wall that keeps us imprisoned in our own belief systems. Mm -hmm. And what happens? They get more virulent. They're, they're like self-reinforcing in that sense. Um, and so you, you mentioned the idea of an abscess. Well, you know, an abscess is a pool of infection that the body, for whatever reason, can't um, fight off. Mm -hmm. And this wall gets built around it, which is completely unsuccessful. I mean, people with abscesses are, are, are in very bad shape, uh, high fevers, you know, close to death. They usually have to be removed surgically. But... But once you build that wall, yeah, not only are you not bringing forth that which is within you, you've made the choice to intentionally and consciously keep it hidden. Uh, and that will destroy you in the form of an abscess anyway. And I think in, you know, the easiest solution for all the division in the United States of America today and in the rest of the world would be that you know everyone uh, has to get together for dinner and and with, with someone who's getting a different news source and just listen, just listen. And then you get to talk, but then you have to listen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd like to see on some of the uh, talking heads news shows where they have the different sides yelling at each other and talking over each other. Why can't one of the agreements be that when someone else is talking, your mic is silenced, you know, you, you can't even interrupt. And when you're talking, they can interrupt. That right. alone would lead a, lend a, 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 an amount, a, a level of civility that we're you know, sorely lacking. The talking stick idea, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I, I didn't catch the debates the other night, but uh, uh, my wife texted me and I, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be refreshing if instead it was all, the, the whole emphasis was how we're going to work together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I also did see something a few a few weeks or maybe a few months ago now that I'm not sure if the, not sure if it was Photoshop, but I, I, I love the idea. It was kind of like this little little bright sunshiny uh, image of of uh, the slats in the the border wall. Uh, someone has had uh, presumably I, maybe it's true. I don't I'm not sure, but um, 
made a, 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 a seesaw, a teeter totter. Um, and, and, <laughs> and people on both sides of the wall, kids on both sides of the wall were playing with it. So basically taking, and I, which I think is a great metaphor for how Holy Spirit takes everything that the ego erects as a barrier and uses it as a, a means of communication to break down the barriers. And in this case, it was, you know, kids playing with each other on seemingly opposite sides of a, a wall. But That's the, beautiful. Yeah, That's I, I thought that was pretty fun. Yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for those who might be listening in the future, this is, uh, you know, the end of February 2020. So uh, we're looking at Democratic candidates debating, right. which in many instances, more like they're all just yelling at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and not that the republicans are any different <laughs> right right yeah it, it's the irony of course is that that you know the, what's with that cliche you know all of us are smarter than any one of us and 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 of course miracle certainly takes that to the max by saying there's really only one of us and yeah. that's really the only smart <laughs> and everything else is pretty dumb <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically well to the extent that we think we have the answer we think we have a plan for that we think you know um you can plan whatever you want. It's a moving target. And that's, yeah. so coming back to our own personal lives, that's the beauty, again, of, of being able to receive guidance, yes, about the world you are in from the Holy Spirit. Um, I think that in um, the Circle of Atonement edition, in one of the cameos, there's, and I get confused about where I see things or what I may have heard uh, about the Helen and Bill days, but there's a lovely story either there or elsewhere about Helen looking, trying to find a coat and searching all over and, and, and the voice of Jesus saying to her, why are you spending all that effort? I could tell you exactly where you need to go to buy your coat. Now, most people would say, oh, that's wrong. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't get involved at the level of buying a coat. To which I would respond, well, if that's something that is going to take you into distress, then why can't he respond at that level? Mm -hmm. um, why, once again, are we establishing the world of illusion as somehow impermeable to the Holy Spirit? Of course he can take you there. The moment you turn it into magic, I've got this Holy Spirit, and he's mm -hmm. going to show me where to get a coat, and he's going to do it better than he would do it for you. Okay, now it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, once we're back to level of confusion, all bets are off. Huh? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's a great, um, great example. Yeah, but yeah we, we need the guidance. And wow, would I ever look forward to a day where someone in the position of, you know, a president or a prime minister, you know, had a circle around him where they were like, yeah, what do we do with this, this famine, this virus, this war? Well, let's get quiet and ask and see what we get. I mean, that would be a real game changer. Yeah. And, and it does change the game when we move from the, the seemingly countless options that the ego presents that are all, you know, illusion A, illusion B, illusion C, and, and head infinitum <laughs> on a horizontal plane of the dream and, and, and switch over to the vertical axis of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, above the battlefield, above the maze, <laughs> there's yeah. this real alternative that that um, sees all illusions as equally silly and not you know evil sinful or wicked but just silly and and uh, oh yeah I, I could i could see peace instead of this i could forgive all this yeah yeah not worth the time we invest in them very literally exactly i'm, I'm gonna grab another another quote that i enjoyed here um Oh, this is from the course. A one-to-one -one relationship is not one relationship. It is the means of return, the way God chose for the return of his son. And then your commentary. We use relationship to work our way back to wholeness when we make the commitment to see the other differently. The other is not an object to be manipulated or bargained with or to get something from. They are not an it, but a thou, a holy being in whom we behold the reflection of our own holiness. To achieve this, we Proceed relationship by relationship, forgiving the grievances that cloud our vision of the other, no matter how small or insignificant they seem. The tiniest flicker of irritation will stand in the way of love and bar us from wholeness. In the same way, we must cleanse our relationships of all trace of specialness. Specialness depends on comparison. One particular thing, person, or outcome is judged as more desirable than another, and this too stands in the way of wholeness. 
which to me kind of ties into that illusion A, illusion, illusion B, illusion C are all the same, but, but specialness says, oh no, this, yeah. this illusion is way more important than that, that illusion. <laughs> yeah. So one of the questions that comes up fairly regularly when I do um, webinars through the Foundation for Inner Peace on relationship is, well, does the court, is the course saying that, um, that, be, that I can't have a relationship? You know, if you're going to practice the course, does that mean you can't have any, you know, any real partner in life? And I would answer that, I do answer that by saying, no, I'm just the opposite. It really says that you want to have and, and welcome relationships wherever they show up because mm -hmm as I say in, in the book, those are the crucibles for enlightenment. That's where we do um, that work. And the idea that, um, that one relationship would, would somehow be more essential or valuable than another is, is, is limiting. I mean, yes, there are those relationships. Uh, in my book, I call them level three relationships. This is in one of the last chapters where you're with someone for you know most of your life and they keep showing up whether positively or negatively and man there's just a lot of learning there um, those are rare for a reason but you know we can learn everywhere and um and and this is true even within your family i mean you feel love for your partner if you have children you feel love for your children and that love it may be maximal but it's not the same you know, I, I once heard someone say, uh, well, I've only got one child, so if mine were to be killed, I'd be devastated, but you have two, so, you know, you're better off. If one of yours died, you'd still have one, to which the response is, no, 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 there's much more vulnerability, because if either of them dies, you know, it's going to be pretty devastating. But when I convert that to the arena of love, rather than ego fear thoughts, it's like, yeah, if you have children, you know they are very, very different, very unique, um, and yet somehow the love is is there and is maximal, uh, even when they are not behaving in ways that you like or approve of. You know, they go through stages. Um, a long time ago, I worked with someone um, whose whose son was basically a sociopath. He would forge checks in her name. Um, every time he'd come visit, you know, it'd be charming and wonderful. And eventually there'd be the pitch, you know, hey, mom, can you lend me a couple thousand dollars? Uh, or maybe it was a couple hundred because it was a long time ago. Um, and she finally got to the point of just having this, this wall, I guess, or a boundary is really, because it wasn't a wall, it was a boundary that said, no matter what happens, if I interact with my child around money, we're going to be in a position of, of conflict. So she just put that boundary up. And when he finally got that, that no matter what he did, he would not be able to get money, he relaxed, she relaxed. It's kind of like they just took that completely out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And they actually started having a loving relationship again. <laughs> I thought it was an amazing lesson in, in how sometimes, um, you know, you, you do have to hold a boundary and just kind of push aside something that you're not perhaps able to overcome with another person because they can't do it. They're not willing to join you in it. And yet when you do that and you're absolutely clear, and notice she didn't, um, you know, reject him from her life. She didn't say you're reprehensible and I never want to see you again, blah, 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 blah. She just made it clear. And I, I like to envision it with a smile that no matter what he did, he could stand on his head, he could, you know, cut his hand and say, look, mom, bleeding, please help. That her cardinal rule was, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you money. I will love you. I will support you. I will help you. I, I can't give you money. Mm -hmm. And that, that was what allowed that relationship to transform and become something loving. Yeah. So we don't always know the path, but if we're certain that what we want is the love, because, you know, what else could we want? Um, the love finds a way. And, and that can involve things that, you know, you might go, well, that's not very loving. Of course it is. She refused to give in to his addictive need that mm -hmm. blocked either of them from getting to love. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. That one's yeah. not in the book. <laughs> well, but yeah, that, that's a great example, and it kind of kind of reminds me of you know, the, uh, you know another example that I oftentimes come you know come back to is you know a, a mother pulling her child out of traffic, you know, about to go blindly into an intersection or something, and 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 scolding them, but with love, you know. And it's again, it seems like the important thing, and it seems like so much of what the, uh, A Course in Miracles attempts to to share is that that you know that it's it's what's in our mind it's always and only about the mind and and if if we while we're interacting and whatever behavior is happening remember that it's the spirit that um you know we're identified with and that that spirit is ultimately completely loving um and like you say you know the behavior can seem to be uh challenging or or restrictive or whatever, but if it's done with the idea of love, you know, you know, like you say, maybe it's that's, you know, eliminating an addiction that really is standing in the way of the awareness. So. Yes. Yeah. I'm and also I, thinking about that that story about Bill Thetford, who a, a guy who gave away all his money and said the Holy Spirit said to come knock on your door, and and Bill Thetford's response was, "Wow, well, Holy Spirit said you were coming and told me not to give you any money." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe you heard that from Bill himself. Uh, I, I did not, but oh, okay. uh, I, I do enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I also enjoy the way the um, apocrypha creeps in around Bill and Helen, and, uh, and that's just natural, you know. Um, yeah, that, that, that's just natural. Yeah. I, you know, one of the cardinal rules of uh, child rearing is, you know, punish or scold the behavior, not the not the person, not the being. Yeah, yeah. Don't say to your child, "You are bad." Right. Say, you know teasing your sister is bad or, you know, crossing the street in traffic is not something you want to do because yeah, you could be hurt and we don't, you know, I love you. I don't want you to be hurt. Yeah. Applying that to the world of the course. Yeah. All of our behavior that isn't an expression of love or a response to the call for help or healing, all of that, it's not bad. It's just misdirected, misguided and purposeless and ultimately going to get us nowhere. Um, so you know, the being is never bad. The being, that which is in each of us, is love and only love. And if we keep that in mind, you know, there are times where the Holy Spirit will say, get out of that relationship. Um, he doesn't mean that's a terrible person. He means right now, there is no more learning at the level of readiness that you and they are at. There's no more learning to be had. It's just going to recycle all of the old garbage, and your grievances will probably compound. Um, so you go away. You take a break. Maybe the break is permanent within this lifetime. Uh, if you subscribe to reincarnation, you'll probably get a chance to work it out again. Or maybe they come back into your life in a year. Maybe they come back into your life in a month and go, you know, I, I really miss you, and I recognize what I was doing was toxic. I'd like to work this out in a different way. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but if we, we follow guidance, yeah, sometimes uh, we're being told to end the relationship as we conceptualize it. But the, the real relationship never ends because that's between you know, the, the, the oneness in you and the oneness in them, the love in you and the love in them. But back to lesson 186 that we read earlier, the form that takes is going to look different. You know? And love can take the form of, no, I, I'm not doing that or I can't do that anymore mm -hmm. um, without, without um, undermining the love. Yeah, without any kind of demeaning or condemning or, you know, yeah. derisive yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, I think we've, uh, gone for about an hour and, and covered a fair amount of ground. I know there's a lot more to cover and I, I just barely scratched the notes that I took of reading the next 50 pages. And uh, I, I think it might be appropriate to schedule another conversation and pick up where we left off. Yeah, and, definitely. I and because uh, there's just so much in this, in this wonderful book of yours. And uh, again, um, you can um, get uh, from loving one to one love, transforming relationships through a course of miracles uh, from Amazon or Bob's website, which is drbob-author.com or acimblog.com and probably a lot of other places too. And anyway, highly recommended. And thanks again, Bob, for uh, spending an hour or so with me talking about your new book and uh, look forward to the next conversation. Yeah. Anything else you want to add or any announcements? Uh, um, 
Mm, well, for those who are watching in a more timely basis, I'll be at the uh, uh, Course in Miracle Society conference, uh, as will you. Um, in Looking Las forward Vegas, to that. Yes, very Memorial much. Day weekend 2020. So if you're there, come up and say hi or uh, check out my talk, whatever it's going to be. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, I will also be featuring some uh, half hour talks in the presenter series that's hosted by Bill Free. Um, I should know off the top of my head how you sign up for that. Uh, I'm afraid I don't. You'll have to you know, search it online. But what I really want to say is that, you know, this talk was about relationships. And in 1978, in a special message, what, what they call special messages, not that they're special, they just weren't part of A Course in Miracles, um, Helen's voice of Jesus gave the foundation for inner peace the specific mission to, and I quote, publish, distribute, and discuss A Course in Miracles. I really fixate and focus on that word discuss. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. It did not say teach A Course in Miracles. You know, there's a manual for teachers that makes it very clear we're all students and we're all teachers. The only thing that separates that is time, learning, and did you do the workbook yet or not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and, and we're all teaching all the time. One or two all, thoughts. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. in there. We're yeah. all teaching all the time, yeah. um, which also means we're all hopefully learning all the time. Yeah. So the format of a discussion like what we are doing here, for me, is the optimal vehicle mm -hmm. for conveying what the course is all about. You will trigger things in me that I never could have come up with myself staring at my computer monitor. And vice versa. And vice versa. <laughs> Absolutely. So I much this, appreciated, this, yes. Yeah, th th this is how it works. And um, this is my preferred you know, format. And uh, yeah, so let's do it again. And, uh, and we will. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, uh, I guess that's it for now. Look forward to the next conversation. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank Bless you. you.